Alrighty, welcome back to 105. So we got good news and we got bad news. Which would you like first? There are, there is good news and bad news. <laughs> what would you like first? Bad news, all right, so the bad news uh, is not bad news for, yeah, not bad news for anyone here, but core staff ran the plagiarism detection and most of the people that cheated were in my section. Yay. So, in your section? yeah, we're in this section, which is disappointing because I get to have fun meetings with no one that I can see in this class. So anyone that attends lectures is good, but someone watching this recording, um, yeah, disappointing. So, and it's only lab six. So hopefully I do not see you in that context, but I guess for the good news, so the good news, I'm away at a conference next Wednesday and Friday, and we are ahead of the other sections, so they're canceled, yay. So next Wednesday, so I'll post it on Corcus next Wednesday and Friday, I will not be here, so I will not be doing lectures. And to make up for it, since our exam is like the second last day, I will just do like an online two hour review session like a week before the final, whenever it seems good to make up for that two hours. And we'll just do final review close to the final because for some reason your final is like at the very end because you got unlucky. So that sound good? All right. Wednesday and Friday, right? Sorry? Wednesday and Friday. Next Wednesday and Friday, yeah. March 20th and 22nd and I'll make an announcement for that too. All right. So yeah, we're ahead of the other section, so we get some more practice today. So we're doing recursion on string. So third time I say this now, so this is fairly important. So a recursive function, function that calls itself. Two things, we need a base case, so a simple solution we know, and a recursive step to reduce the problem to a smaller version of itself. Specifically with strings, there's like three general major ways to think about recursive solution with strings. So the smaller problem could just be like a character followed by a smaller string, whatever's remaining. Maybe a smaller string then followed by a single character. And then you just do that. So that's working from the end instead of the beginning. Or maybe it is two characters enclosing a smaller screen. So a start, like one at the front, one at the back, and then you make the string smaller, look at those two, make the string smaller, so on and so forth. So we can do some more practice. So can we recursively check if a string is a palindrome, which means a palindrome is just a string that's the same forwards, forwards, yeah, forwards as it is backwards, like race car, like mom, like dad, like I'm out. Wow, wow, wow is a good one. Uh, yeah, I don't know really any other ones. So let's go ahead and try to come up with a solution for it. So here I just wrote a little main function that again does the second version which takes arguments from the command line or from typing in their terminal. So again, check that there's two arguments. First is gonna be the program name and then the second I assume is just going to be the string we're going to check whether or not is a palindrome. So if I just do is palindrome and I do race car, whoops, race. So this should tell me if this function returns true, it should say, indicate that it is a palindrome. If it's false, it should say it is not. And since we have not implemented anything, it says race car is not a palindrome, which is not true because currently this is my implementation for the is palindrome function. So. Any ideas of how I would write this function recursively? Ooh. So again, think of what our base case or base cases are, and then a recursive solution to said problem. Yep. Well, yeah, so. Yeah, so may, maybe base case E is, uh, so let's say we need the length of a string. So, whoops, then. Because you're worried about like a situation where you have like odd or even number of characters. 
Yeah, well, so maybe, so our base case, maybe if the lang is one, we just return true. And then. Yeah. So we could return S zero. Yeah, so we get a bit problem here once we do a recursive step because we want to like chop off the first and the last, right? So the way I have it written right now is I could do that, but that just chops off the first, right? So. Yeah, and we kind of need to check if the first and the last are also equal. So it looks base casey, but we need a bit more help here. So we kind of want to, you know, enclose it from both sides. We, we have to move those zero bytes up Yeah, so, yep. Um, I think, like, the two main base cases would be, like, one of them is, like, the first character does not equal the last character. We should just return, like, a false. Mm -hmm. And then maybe the second base case is, like, if the first character is, like, equal to the last character, because you can keep stepping inwards. Oh, so when like we make a string so small that it's just one character or zero? Yeah, because like, I mean, yeah, I don't know. What I'm thinking about with the recursive step is just like. So like, let's, let's think. So if we have the example race car, so maybe, well, our recursive step could be like, we just check the, the first and the last character and then if they're not equal, we know for sure it's not a palindrome, right? But, oh, yeah? Sorry, I think we do need the case for like zero. For zero, yeah. For zero, because like the case for length of two, that becomes your like, it could be like one of the like recursive ones. Because like you check, you check first and last. Like you can still do check of first and last on a string of size two. So like basically if your length is like two or greater, you do the iterative step. And otherwise. So if, if it's. But I would argue, so the comment is if it's two or greater, I should, or if it's exactly two, I should check both characters well, I mean, as part of my base case. I just feel like it could be moved into like the like recursive case. Like it's, you know, it has like enough material to. Yeah, so like the, the case of length two should kind of cover the recursive case. Yeah. Right, okay. So yeah, so in this case, maybe if we think about this, you know, are like the first and last character are the same, so it might be a palindrome, so we just have to check the inner string. So we might check, you know, what is this, ace, AC? So, is that right? Yeah. And then we would check, oh, CA. Then we would check these characters. Okay, they're the same, so we keep on trying. And then maybe we check, oops, and then we would have the string, what? Kek, kek, almost kek, needs k's. So then, oh, okay, c and c are the same. So then we just have a single character, and then that feels base casey, like yeah. just a single thing is a palindrome by definition. Or maybe there's no characters left, like yeah. our indexes are the same. So with this, it kind of looks like the information we need is like we need one what indexes to compare for the characters, right? So this one would be like, we're comparing zero and whatever the, like, the string length minus one. So that might lend us to think that we probably need a helper function. We need more arguments than just a string, right? Yeah. Uh, what we could uh, try to do is that, you know, like, uh, you say get to go in right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. So not quite, we do need a helper function. You're right that we could have two strings, but we still have to make another function maybe, yeah? I think in, in your helper function, you probably need to like, Here. you need to add one, well actually before that, you need to set the base case, so. Uh, so in the helper function, first thing, usually we just think about what like arguments we need. So we need the string. Yeah, so we could do what you said, like we could make another string or another pointer that points to the last and move them, or I could use indexes directly. Indexes might make more sense to me, so I could be, do like the first index and then the last index, something like that. So now, okay, what our base case was before is like, if the, two, if the first and the last characters did not equal each other, right, we know for sure it's not a palindrome. So that could be one of our base cases. So if the first character does not equal, oops, the last character, then for sure it is not a palindrome. We can stop, we don't have to worry about anything, right? So what would our other base case be? Like when we essentially get down to a single character? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, is that what you're gonna, yeah. So like, yeah, the first could equal the last one. Yeah. The first value equal the last one, or it's like the first value like cross equal to the last one. Could yeah. So the first greater than or equal to the last one? Yeah, so our two cases we're kind of worried about is the first should always be the lower index than the, uh, than the last, right? So at least we need to make sure that if first is greater than last, then, well, there's really nothing to compare, like we overshot it. So that means it is a palindrome. We also have to consider the case where first is equal to last, which means the string is of length one, right? So all we would say is greater than or equal to last, and that covers both. So that looks like kind of our two base cases, right? We either compare the characters and they're not a palindrome for sure, or hopefully we have checked everything else and we're down to either a single character or it crossed over, which means essentially we're down to no characters. So those looks like good base cases to me. And again, uh, since there's a return statement, it could be else if, it could be if, doesn't really matter. And then let's have our recursive step. Could be in an else, could not be, doesn't matter. So what would our recursive step be? Whoops, base C. Yeah. So return, so we need to name this something better, so, okay. Helper, all right. It's harder to type standing than it is sitting for some reason. So I have to call my helper function, then give it s, and then what else should I give it? First plus one, last minus one. Yeah, first plus one, last minus one. So I'm moving one character forward each time and one character backwards. So I'm just squishing it by one each time, right? So that looks good to me. Anyone have any arguments with that? All right, looks pretty decent to me. So that is my helper function, but we were tasked with writing this is palindrome, which doesn't take anything. So what should I write for my is palindrome function that just takes a C string. Yeah, just do a call to helper. Yeah, so my first should be zero. Yeah, so the second one should be string length minus one because they're indexes, right? We want to go to the last character. If we index like string length directly, like the byte at index string length, that should be a null byte, 
So it would be valid, would be a null byte, but we don't want to check the null byte versus anything. So because it's zero indexed, it should be string length minus one. So let's hope we go. So it says race car is a palindrome. So maybe we just wrote it bad. So let's see race car. Oh, not a palindrome. Sweet. Single, let's do single letter. A is a palindrome. That's good. AA, AA is a palindrome. What about, what about just empty? <laughs> Nothing. It's a palindrome. <laughs> Makes sense. Uh, let's scream. Uh, is a palindrome. Seems to work, yeah. So on an exam, if we were given a recursive task, uh, are we allowed to make helper functions? Yeah, on an exam, if, if you're given a task, you're totally allowed to make helper functions. In the interest of time, I would just, you know, for an exam, I would probably do this and just name it helper because the less you have to write, the better. But yeah, it should be the same thing. So I would just write that on an exam. And yeah, so there's a question, why was this reading it as blank? So just has to do with how your shell works. Um, like whatever you're typing into works. I shouldn't say the word shell because you don't know what that is. Basically, whatever I type to run this, if I just give it empty quotes, it's kind of like C-ish rules, where that kind of just represents a string, a string that has nothing in it. Because if I just did quotes and I did hi, whoops. I didn't build it? Oh, yeah, I didn't build it. Okay, oh, right, because I didn't call the helper. All right, I'll just rename it. So if I do double quotes and hi, it just takes the string high, the double quotes don't go in. Kind of like if I wanted to put double quotes literally in a string in C, I would have to like escape them the same way. So funnily enough, it should say that's a palindrome because double quotes equal double quotes. So that would also work. But that's just rules for like how this runs. It kind of derives the same rules as C. All right, any other questions with that? Cool, so we can get some fun stuff too. So here's that. So I will pre or I'll preempt this by saying the following I'm about to show you is more features in C that you shouldn't use for this course. However, you might have to read them or use them in the future, uh, although some of them are bad ideas. So one, ternary conditional operator. It's ugly, uh, some people use it. So if you ever see a question mark in C, it's valid. So it's another expression and the syntax is a conditional. So something that will evaluate either to true or false and then a question mark. And then while the value to evaluate this expression to if that condition is true and then a colon and then a value if it is false. So you can use it in the lab if you really want because we don't really read your code, but like this stuff, unless it's very simple, I suggest not doing this because this might save you like declaring a variable and then an if and an else. So if I declared a variable and then did like if conditional, set it to true, set or set to this value if it was true, else set to this value, it'd be the same thing. This is just done in one line. So some examples are, well, this one's really, really small, but if you did true question mark one colon zero, true is true. So the value of this expression will just be one. If I do false question mark zero colon zero, well, it's false. So the result of this whole expression is going to be zero. So you can choose to use it, use it for really simple things because if you do some gigantic piece of thing and then a question mark at the end, it might just look like you're questioning your own sanity or something like that. And then like if the value is really complicated, it, it like quickly becomes really annoying to read, especially if you like read your code later and like you even forget question marks exist. It's like the only time you use question marks. So you might want to avoid it, but for little things where it is very obvious, 
you may use it, but generally discourage because it's just something else you have to remember. It doesn't really give you any features aside from just making things a bit shorter and more compact, which, you know, I mean, that's the whole principle behind like mathematical notation. No one can read it, but you can write it really fast. Yeah. In an exam, this would save you time. Am I allowed to put this on? In an exam, it would save you time. Am I allowed to put it on? Uh, that's a good question. <laughs> we will have to see because you are the only section that has seen this. Yeah, I would play it safe and not, um, especially, um, yes, some of the grading kind of gets sketchy as it is already, so probably best to avoid this. All right, other fun thing you can do is you can give your own meaning to numbers and use that meaning with something called an enum, short for enumeration. It's basically defining your own type. So the syntax for it is, is like typically it represents some type of category or something like that. So you could say a num and then give it a name and then you could essentially just give a name to some value and then actually tell C like the actual integer value you want that name to represent because you know ASCII at the end of the day, it just is a mapping to a character to a number and defined by the ASCII standard, and you can go ahead, you can define your own magic numbers if you want. So, if you want to define your own enum, it's a new type, so you can just use that variable as a type. It should be just below the includes and not within a function. So, for example, we could, so yeah, question, is it by any chance similar to a class and object in Java? It's our own type, but it's our own, it's essentially our own integer type. So it just converts directly to a number. We will get into, if you've heard of the word class or anything like that, we'll get into that in the next lecture. And all sections will have that. Only we talk about enums because, you know, you'll probably see it in C. So how is it used? So you might create an enum, like typically for a month. Maybe I don't want to remember the month number, like, I don't know, for the longest time, I couldn't figure out what month number May was and I'd have to like Google it every time. So if you're dumb like me, you might just rather have names you can refer instead of the numbers. So I could create an enum called month and then just give each name, so each month name its own number that corresponds to its actual month number. So like January could be one, February could be two, March could be three, so on and so forth. I could do this without an enum, it just helps you read your code a bit better. So like for example, it's basically an int, and how I would use it is instead of declaring the type as int month, I could just use enum month, and then that is the type, and I could also just call my variable month if I want to not be creative. And why would I do that? Well, because if I write a function like this, it reads a bit better. You can actually kind of understand what the hell I'm talking about. So if I write a function that is, is winter semester, where you give it a month and it tells you whether or not this month is actually in the winter semester, well, without this, I'd have to write like return if the month is equal to one or two or three or four. Maybe it's easier to read if you just say, hey, it's the month January, February, March, or April. And then someone reading this might be like, oh, okay, well, that's obviously right. I don't have to look up anything else. Seems to be good. And how you would use it in your program, if you use it as like a scanf, it's just an integer. So I could just say enter month one through 12, do a scanf with a uh, percent %d specifier because it's an integer. And then my function would go ahead and work as I expect. So here's what that would look like, and maybe I do month, enter a month, uh, let's say whatever the month three was, that's this month, right, March, yep, all right, I'm great, and then it says, yeah, probably in the winter semester. So, just makes it a bit easy to read. And, yeah, and enums are only for ints uh, in other languages or like in the next C, uh, C++, you can use it for doubles and stuff like that, but
But in C, it's basically just an integer. They keep it simple. Yeah? Why, why do you say enum month month? So enum month is like the type, like saying this, it matches that. So it's basically the exact same as just saying int. So it's basically saying it's an int called month. But instead of int, I have to write enum month. And I just called my enum month month because I'm not creative. <laughs> but like I could change this to any name I want as long as I update everything else. Like I could change this to M, but then I just have to update my variables. And that's no problem. But if I change this enum month to any name, it's going to say, I don't know what the hell that is because it has to match that type up there. So you might see this in code. You might not. Basically, it's just you can create your own magical numbers because, well, all computers are, are magical numbers. And guess what? LLMs, like the big, large language models, well, they just assign parts of words to numbers and then generate random more numbers. Yay, everything's a number. Um, OK, yeah, I answered that, where in C, it is basically just an integer. So, whoops. So I could also do like a num that represents maybe a direction or something like that. So like maybe I say uh, north is one, and then here I don't specify numbers for anything else. So C has some very simple rules where it will assign numbers for you. So it will just assign them to you sequentially. So if I just say one and say nothing else, well then that means east is going to be two, it's basically going to just take that number and increment it every single time. So in this case, east would be 2, south would be 3, and west would be 4. So it just assigns numbers in the order that you write them in after that a num. And if I didn't say north is equal to 1, the default is the first thing is just equal to 0. So if I didn't write anything, north would be 0, east would be 1, south would be 2, west would be 3. So, but as I wrote that, for some reason, maybe I want north to start at one, so I could just write one, let it fill it in, and again, it will get, it will assign the numbers like this. So, why would I want to do such a thing? So, I might want to do such a thing, because maybe I write like a print direction function, and maybe I use it like this. So, typically, this is also what they're used for to like kind of identify something, maybe you want to print the direction. So maybe I write print direction that takes you num direction, and then I check, well, if the direction is north, I'll just print the string north. If it's east, I'll print east. If it's south, I'll print south. If it's west, I'll print west. And then, you know, in your program, you can just say print direction. Maybe I want to print, I don't know, whatever west is. So take my magical west value, which in this case, is just the value four. Run it, and then whenever I run this, it should, yeah, it should just print west, whoops. So, typically, you use it like that. This probably looks like a bit like one of your labs where you just had directions, you just had more directions. So, typically, it kind of looks like this. So, any questions about that? Yeah. Yeah, so other ways I could make this shorter is I could have, uh, if I wanted to, I could have an array of strings and I could index them by the enum number and just look it up. So that is something I could do. Um, we'll see something that's equivalent that pretty much gets the same thing across. So any questions about this? Perfectly valid way to write, but yours would probably go faster. Um, so here I'm printing, there's like a lot of repetition here, right? It's like if D is equal to north, do something. If D is equal to east, do something. If D is equal to south, do something. Oh, it kind of gets like a pain in the ass. So 
Instead of many ifs, there's another construct called a switch. And you might have seen this before too. It just saves you a bit. It has some weirder rules, which I guess is why it's discouraged, but we can go into it. So the syntax of a switch statement is switch and then a variable name. And the rule for it is it will just check whatever the value of the variable is. And then essentially the execution of your program will just jump to some what, like one of these case statements that matches that value. So C just skips directly to there and starts running whatever code comes after it. So like case and then some value, that's not something it can run. That's just where the code will go to. Then it will start executing it until either it reaches a break statement, which we saw in loops. So it behaves a bit differently in switch statements. If it encounters a break statement anywhere within a switch statement, it just goes directly to the end, like the monopoly go to jail. So you just go directly to jail. Don't ask, what is it? Don't collect $200, something, something. Do not pass go, do not collect $200. All right. So yeah, so that's how it works. Otherwise, it just executes statements until it makes it to the end of the switch statement. And to like with, if statements, we could have an else if it doesn't match anything. So the equivalent for a switch statement, you can have a case called default. And if there are no matches anywhere else, it will jump to that default label. Otherwise, it just skips directly to the end. So I could rewrite my code a bit differently if I don't, just don't want to check the value of D over and over again. In this case, it doesn't really save me any lines, it, but it saves me from writing D over and over and over again. So possibly a bad example, but kind of illustrates the point. So here I could switch on D, and then if it's north, then we would start executing the next statement after this. So it would print F north, and then break, which would go to the end and not execute anything else. In the case that we saw, it would jump here to west, then print at west, break, go to the end. Otherwise, if it didn't match anything, it would just exit the program with a failure. So typically, this is what you do for enums. You'll like put some error handling code in the default because, I oh don't know, in this case, I'm probably not going to come up with a new direction other than north, south, west, and east. Wow, I forgot my directions, that's great. But Maybe you come along and you're like, hey, maybe I'll just consider up a direction, up and down. And then if you do this, then suddenly up and down would not be covered. So maybe you have the default case where you get some error code instead of just not doing anything. So other, so any questions about that? Probably wouldn't save you time, yeah? Yeah, so this is slightly faster than if statements for most compilers because it will do what uh, you suggested. And essentially this internally builds an array and will just go directly to the array instead of checking, oh, is this, okay, else if, is this, oh, is, da, 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 right? So this, like, I can't do anything complicated. I'll just check the value of this and then jump to one of these. So it can't do anything complicated, just checks a single value. But it's a bit easier for that, and yeah, this will actually generally run faster because it'll implement it as essentially an array. All right, any other questions about this? All right, so, um, oh, whoops. Yeah, another question. If there's no indentations, would C know where the case block ends? or doesn't know based where the next case is. So in this case, what a pun. So weird things that will happen. So the indentation here doesn't matter at all. So if I even move this, oops. So what is my computer doing? All right, so if I move this, like indentation, well, no indentation C cares about at all. So if I do something like this, doesn't matter. Usually with case statements, you indent the case at the same level as switch. That's just generally how people do it. But you could do it like this if you want. Not gonna affect anything. C doesn't actually really care. 
So if I run this, let's just make sure that this does the exact same thing. So let's print direction, let's print south. So now if I print south, oh, print west. Oh, wait, that was the wrong, uh, wrong program, sorry. So yeah, print south. So fun things we could do here. Maybe I, here, let's have some fun. So maybe after my south, maybe I forgot this break. Common mistake. Any guesses what will happen if I just forgot to put that break in? Yeah. So does it, so you think it'll just continue going so it will? So it'll do this and then exit? So the west one? So south, then west, and then it's done? So, so yeah, there's a com comment. There's no way it's going to step into west. So we will not see west printed at all, right? Southwest. So the rule here is it executes as normal, like we C can't execute these case statements, so they essentially get ignored. So what happens is, in this case, I have print direction south. So it would find, like, we switched on D, it's currently south. So execution would jump here in the switch statement. Well, this isn't something it can execute, but it would execute print F, print out, out south. And then the next line, it just goes line by line, like normal. It wouldn't execute this line, because well, it just says case west. Well, that's where I would go if it was a west. I don't really care because I'm executing. So it wouldn't execute that. Then it would execute print west, and then it would print or execute break, and then go to the end. So, oh, so cases are only for like when we step into the switch the first time. That's like yeah, yeah. Cases only come into effect whenever you like. It's just where to start in the switch. Yeah, yeah. It's like a label. Yeah. Yeah, if you have encountered labels, hopefully you haven't before, but it's basically a label. Can't execute it, can't do ever. Just tells you where to go. So that is a common, very common kind of drawback with that is if you kind of write it like that where each thing should do its own independent thing. If you forget a break, well then you have this weird thing where it just kind of skips into the other one and you might not expect that. You might get like Southwest. Um, and if you really screw it up, like the labels can be right next to each other. So even if you do something like this, well, if it's south, it's going to match here, here. Let's just say we forgot both lines. So if the value is south, it's still going to jump here. Then while well, the next thing it's going to execute is not that, not going to execute, then it would just print west and then break and then be done. So if we compile this and we just forgot everything and just print west, what would happen if I just forgot the case completely? So, yeah, so if I forgot the case completely, probably won't see anything, but we see this minus this one thing, which essentially means it hit this exit. So because south doesn't match any of these, it would match default and then just exit, run that, and my program is done now. It doesn't really matter what else is there. So do, do, do. All right, other questions about that? Fun, looks kind of ugly though. If you, like, having enum direction D kind of, or when I had enum month month kind of looks ugly. So let's solve that ugliness problem. So you can rename types with another new keyword called a type def. So the syntax of a type def is you just take an existing type and then you give it a new name. So you just replace new name by whatever you want to call your new type 
and then the type by whatever you would like to use in place of this name. So why would you want to do that? Well, for example, I could write something like type def int to number t, number underscore t. So then afterwards, I can declare variables with the type number underscore t. And then if later I decided, well, I don't like integers anymore, every number I want in my program, now I want to be a double. Well, I can just change the type def to be type def double number t, and then suddenly my integers are now replaced by doubles, and I only have to change one thing. And note here, usually we append like an underscore t to indicate that it's a type. So let's see how clever we are. So here I have my type def number. Whoops. So here I have my type def number. So Whenever I use a number t, it will replace that by an int whenever we compile it. But here, let's create a number t called a, one called b, sign, like initialize it to one, or sorry, two and three, and then add them together. So if I go ahead and run this, right, I, I print it as a int. If I run this, what am I going to see? Five, hopefully, <laughs> right? A plus B is five, all right, yeah, we're not crazy, right? So why this might, so generally using a type def with ints is a very bad idea because what happens if I actually do what I suggested before, which I do not suggest, do not do this, what would happen if I just did this? Will it give me a warning? Let's see. So yeah, it's already given me some hint that says format specifies int, but their argument is type double. So sure, I changed my numbers. Like if I just wrote double A and double or double A and double B, sure, it would just get like 2.0 and 3.0. But whatever, it doesn't change your format specifiers. So you're probably going to be screwed because you probably use that somewhere. So now you have a mismatch where this is now, you change it to a double and your format specifier is for an integer. And generally when you lie to C functions, very poor things happen. So we get negative a lot. <laughs> so we lied, oops, we made our mistake. So not really going to save you any time. I should have just switched them back to a double anyways because, oops, because to fix it, I'll have to go through it anyways and change a whole bunch of things. So I would have to change that to LF and then, yay, it works how you would think. But you, know, you might go ahead and forget something. All right, so why did I show you type def if it is such a poor idea? Well, the typical use of it, you have to get into some weird C language rules which I looked ahead and is encouraged. Some people like doing this, some people don't. So what you can do is you can use that type def to save you from writing a num all the time with types. So you can actually create a enum without a name. <laughs> that is a perfectly valid thing to do. If I did it without a type def, it would be useless because I'd never be able to create a variable of that type because it doesn't have a name. But what this does is it says type def. So just take this existing nameless enum that has a north, east, south, and west, and I will rename it direction underscore t. So then afterwards, if I want to create a variable with it, instead of enum direction direction, you might argue that this is a bit nicer to read, where it's just direction underscore t so the type of a direction, and then I call it a direction, and then I could do equal north. Something you can do. Cool, right? Maybe. <laughs> so, uh, so final exercise, going back to string recursion. Um, so could we implement stir car recursively? So that is where it searches for a character in a string and returns you a pointer to the match or null if there is in no match. So 
I can leave that to you. Yeah, so quickly, this looks like the case of recursion where I should probably just think about the first character and then the rest of the string. In this case, if the first character matches the string I'm looking for, I should just return a pointer to the string. Otherwise, if I make it to the end and make it to the null byte, I should just return null to say I don't have any match. So our solution should probably, I'll just put this up real quick, probably look something like this. So I can cheat a little bit. So instead of indexing one, zero, or element zero, the same th I could do the same thing by just dereferencing the string since it points to the first character anyways. So my base cases would be if the current character I'm pointing at is the null byte, return null, there's no match. Otherwise, if the uh, first character equals the character I'm looking for, return the current string. Otherwise, in my recursive case, well, I could just move the pointer one character over and still search for that same character, right? Nice and simple, nice and compact. And I can go ahead, I can run it. And it does the same thing for both programs. So seems to work. I could search for, I don't know, an A. Whoops. So if I search for an A, it's not found, so they should both return null. The A, they both return null, they seem to work. So questions about that? So I went through it fast, but same. So for extra practice, if you want, you can do stir car car, but it returns the last character, the last match first instead of the first. Could do that. Uh, it's a little bit trickier, but not too much. So any other questions? We can wrap up slightly early. All right, cool. A bunch of new C features that, aside from type def, we will not use. But you might read it, or you might find it useful. You can write whatever you want in your programs. But probably don't use it for the exams. Do not confuse the TAs. Their job is hard enough already. So just remember, pulling for you. We're all in this together.